This program is funded in part by a grant from the Indiana Arts Commission with support from the National Endowment for the Arts. I would love to be a household name opera singer. I never get tired of playing music, ever. I found the music. This is it's universal language. When I play, I'm here to entertain you. I'm not here to be afraid of you and say, well, this is a big day and this is the end of the world and I hope you won't be too hard on me. You'd be hard on me if you want, but I'm here to entertain you. I love to perform. To me, performance is where music lives. Sixteen hundred music students at the Indiana University School of Music share a love of music and the dream of a music career. The music school is a beehive of constant musical activity, with rehearsals, performances, practice, auditions, lessons, hearings, and recitals, all in the pursuit of musical excellence. six I, I started uh, piano lessons. I started piano lessons when I was five. When I was about eight I wanted to be like out of Mozart. I used to dress up like Mozart and sit there and play the piano. Uh, I was ten years old which isn't so early. I've been playing trombone since uh, I was about 12 years old. The music teacher would put on Pachelbel's Bell's Canon. She would put the record on just to attract us into the classroom. Then I was hypnotized. When my voice finally cracked, I found that it had like a little vibrato to it, you know, and I thought maybe, well, I would certainly like to become a singer if, if I could. Everyone who studies here has been in love with music for years, and everyone has a talent and a dream. There are students from 50 states and 41 foreign countries, and back home they were all-star performers, talented musicians hoping for a big-time music career. But here at Indiana, the sobering fact is that everyone has talent, and the intense competition demands constant practice and rehearsal, soon turning high hopes into hard work. Constant practice is a way of life for music students. Any time of night or day provides glimpses of musicians at work, alone or in ensembles, pushing the limits of their abilities, refining a phrase, or working out a fingering. to stand in front of the mirror and surround myself with chairs which represented sections of the orchestra and I'd practice with the score watching myself to make sure that I was clear and also practice cueing all the instruments whenever they came in you have to make sure that whatever somebody does with their hands and with their body is exact enough that it conveys the precise message that you want it to convey it's funny you can really never practice too much Yeah, 
I used to practice about six, seven, eight hours a day, and that's over. Maybe oh, with luck, two or three. Yeah. We're, we're just going downbeat, downbeat, downbeat. Yeah. <laughs> I feel right now quality is better than quantity. Everything I do, I try to think about it as opposed to just practice, practice. Um, maybe not think about it. Wait, stop. Wrong page. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of our social life is based right here in this practice. That's right. I mean, this is our social life. For my benefit, can we try it again? Just to so, yeah, sure. so I don't get nervous. Okay. Okay, coming on the... You're coming in on the upbeat. Yeah. Stay steady right from the beginning. A little slow. It's a little slow there. Because I'm going to try to build up to the speed I want before I hit that run. All right. Ready and. An average day basically is filled with I get up, I have a little something, I watch some TV, I come to school and rehearse all day. I go home and have a little bit to eat, come back and rehearse. And all this constant work, practicing, rehearsing, rushing from one activity to another, is with the goal of performance in mind. And the range of performance opportunities is incredible at Indiana, from solo recitals to grand opera. My favorite thing to do is to play in the pit for an opera. It's my favorite thing. Why? Because, well, maybe I don't like to do so much. In the spotlight. Maybe I like to be in a little dark spot and do my music. And I get caught up into what I'm saying, what I'm saying, what I'm supposed to be saying about the person that I'm supposed to be. And that feeling itself excites me to know that I can come out of Gregory and I can become that person. Playing the violin is an athletic event in itself. It's not something that's very, very easy to do. It's just like uh, uh, you play a difficult spot on the violin. It's like uh, you know, running a few miles or something. It takes 
quite a bit of energy, emotional energy also. Playing the violin is really an emotional thing. I do enjoy a company. It's, there is a lot of pressure to company. I find that, that I get more nervous accompanying someone than I do playing solo. We are an ensemble making music together. Not only me, it's not like I am the star. We are making music. It's the composer who is the real star. It's sharing, really, what is the most important thing. I prefer orchestral playing much more than my solo. You're in an orchestra and you feel in a new society. It's a really good feeling. And you're surrounded with beautiful music. You're right there in your groove. You hear the strings and the brass sometimes. And where as solo, sure, you, you can express yourself very individually, but I don't think I like the repertoire as much. It's a good physical sensation when you're up in front of the group and everybody's responding to what you do. I think the most satisfying thing is working with uh, a group of individuals and feeling like there's a connection, not only between you and the ensemble, but between you, the ensemble, and the audience. There's a certain energy created there. How can you do that if you don't have the support of the people in Nicaragua? I think they will have to kill everybody there because, you know, it, as, as we know, I will see... In days already filled with practice, support, rehearsal, lessons, and people, performance, music like students must also spend considerable time studying and, and attending classes. Anymore, because that, that's not true. They probably will have to stay 10 more years or 15 more years to, to keep control. Why well, taking political science classes? I'm taking language classes, taking Italian. It's very interesting. I, I have the belief that musicians have to have a broad sense of everything, not only music, but religion, politics, humanities, languages. In addition to making music, students also spend a lot of time studying it. There are classes in performance techniques, music history, music theory, and a host of other music-related subjects, many of which require a lot of listening.
All these things make you into a better musician, but the, the requir requirements are very, very difficult. And it's a constant struggle. And you think, oh, should I practice on my voice, or should I really study and sit down and do the theory? Look at a piece of music, take it apart, find out what makes it tick. And that's something that I think is very foreign to people that don't know a lot about music. I used to live with a guy who was from Tanzania. I lived with him for about four or five weeks, and he was amazed that anybody would go to graduate school to study music. He thought it was just pure recreation. Number one. And one of the ways that professors often have their students learn that is to learn a certain repertoire of pieces, say, oh, 30 pieces in the 20th century, and then be able to identify them based upon 30 second segments uh, just played at random, otherwise known as drop the needle. We turn now to music on record. We'll hear the Sonata Number no. 1 in D minor for violin and piano, over 75, of Camille Saint-Saëns. Elma Oliveira is the violinist, Jonathan Feldman the pianist. The crosswalk, I suppose, takes up between one and three hours a day, depending how much that you have. In between that, you're always trying to jam in rehearsals with chamber groups or with singers or with whomever, and then fit practice in between. My days are um, busier yet because I, I work about 20 hours a week and I'm here at the radio station um, trying to fit that in as well. And that can either mean getting up within the wee hours and working here in the morning or sometimes staying up late into the night. I'm not going to say that it's, it's easy being a student unless you're very fortunate and have benefactors or, or parents who can finance your, your um, scholastic career. I work three hours a day in painting and building the uh, sets that I sometimes have to sing on myself. Many of us, many of my friends, uh, have always had to work all through their degrees. It's just a few extra hours you have to put in every day, but it's good. It's good for you. The school is chock full of talent. Incredible, incredible amounts of talent. There's a lot of beautiful voices and beautiful instrumentalists, all kinds of talented people here. The grand scale of the Indiana University School of Music, with its constant activity and sheer volume of talented musicians, is exhilarating for some and disconcerting for others. Well, I like the pressure, and I like to constantly, constantly be going on, on the go. Uh, weekends are completely hectic. I think we said it'll start at 2.30 and end 11 p.m. So there is a lot going on, and I like that. sometimes be frustrating is that you're practicing in an environment where a hundred other people are doing the same thing and many times you can hear them through the walls. Sometimes you wonder, well, is there anything I can say that they can't say? Is it worth me being here? So yes, I get jaded, frustrated sometimes, um, but the music has to show me through. Nothing is ever good enough and you're just too critical and I've seen that in a few cases around Indiana. I've seen people just get so pent up with being a perfectionist that it can be somewhat destructive and that's when you have to take a break I think. You have to get away for however long and just get some distance from what you're doing. I run or I swim or I spend time with my daughter. She's to the point now where she can be quiet during a concert and I think she enjoys it somewhat especially if she knows she's going to get a cookie afterwards. I do other things. <laughs> Let's see, what do I do very intellectual? I read Charlie Brown. And I don't think you should love good literature, really. And uh, Schultz brings me a lot of, he, he helps me find uh, 
little things in life, like for example, happiness is whether or not you're in the right room, and I agree with you. you know, perhaps doing something physical, because I think performing becomes physical after a while. There have been many times when music has become too, too, too much for me. <laughs> I have to get away from it. I don't sing for as long a period of time as I need to mentally get myself back together. I like to go out and if it's a nice day or something, just sit out and watch people. That's very relaxing for me to just watch and see what's going on. Well, I, I, I never get tired, but the uh, music uh, is a complement of life, so you have to do other things. Like, I like to do sports, play basketball, baseball. I like to read. I like to walk and sometimes be alone and think. Sometimes getting away from music just means a different kind of music. Well, I started this house of iron a year after I came here. It's me. So we get together. We want to share our tours and our music with everybody here. And then we share and give for the, the joy of our Latin music. One big reason students come here from all over the world is the opportunity to study with the very best teachers anywhere. I came from Puerto Rico in 1980. Came especially because this school was uh, one of the most famous in, in the country, and especially because the trombone teacher, Keith Brown, who is one of the most well known in the trombone world. Chilomeni is um, a great man, beside being a fabulous artist and a wonderful singer and a very important contribution to music in general as well as the operatic stage. He's just revered in the opera world. And I sing the uh, exact repertoire that he, he learned, and he's teaching me all the wonderful little tricks, we should say, that go along with it. And it's a very special thing. He's a great man. He's a father figure. He's a friend. He's, he's everything. He's everything you could ask for outside of being a fabulous teacher. I met Mr. Bates, my teacher, a few years ago, so I was a bit nervous when I, I chose to study with him. I said, well, maybe you won't want to take me. So I, I go up to him and I said, may I study with you? I was nervous, I was afraid of him. And he said, well, it depends. Are you going to listen to me? So I said, well, if you tell me to change my instruments and paint daisies on it, no, I won't do it. But if you I know that you, you were in an orchestra for many years. If you teach me what you know about this, for sure, I'm, I'm here. So I said, okay, we'll try it out. Good. That's the idea. Yes, and then you start to multiply. Yep. No, from the e. That's from the e. Mr. Presley is a, an incredible musician. And 
and teacher. They don't always go hand in hand. He really pushes his students. It's just great. It was good, but I think you can do it still better. Just the ending of the upper note, if you had a chance. No, if it is da 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 dum, dum. The Indiana music faculty includes internationally acclaimed artists, many of whom, like pianist Menachem Pressler of the renowned Bozar Trio, perform the world over in addition to teaching. Then I have found that I could use all my experiences, what works at 830, what's right, how does one reach an audience, how does it come that the music takes on a new dimension, or how is it that music stays always fresh, that you can play that same piece a hundred times and it still is you. And I have found that very wonderful, because here you become a better musician while trying to make a better music. I started in 1946 my operatic career, my de uh, debut in opera. I sang, I sang something like uh, 75, 78 roles altogether. It's difficult for me to remember them all. And uh, I was very thrilled when uh, this position at the Indiana University has been offered to me because it means to transfer to young the students to transfer to the new generations my experience. That's what I am trying to do. last phrase eh? yeah. because it seems easy it isn't easy because it comes after all the rest which is very engaging and this pianissimo this oh, it must float really you know? oh, you are floating floating upon your dreams <laughs> I, I enjoy teaching, I think, very much because of the, of the chance to be working with students on a constant basis. It, it's, uh, to me, one of the most gratifying things that I could be in at this point. Jaime, musically, I think, is one of the most gifted students that we've, we've ever had here. And he's um, an outstanding musician because I really don't have to teach him like I would have to teach most students. The thing that I do with Jaime is just essentially coaching him. Yeah, once, once more. You know? In other words, Boeing is a cellist would. Since these are cello suites, I'd, I'd think more that way because I think that gives you more of the effect. He tries to, to uh, I would say, pull me back a bit because I've been called around here the wild horse. And uh, well, it seems like he can't tell me exactly what to do because I have already my own ideas. Uh, and she has so much energy and so much enthusiasm and uh, my primary job right now is just trying to control that a little bit and letting things settle down for her. Lessons are a special opportunity, 
a special relationship, a chance to learn from people who've been there and are willing and anxious to share their knowledge and experience. There's a special electricity in a good lesson as teacher and student focus intently on musical details, striving for the perfection that this profession demands. First climax of the piece at this point. But just for us, I would love to have you and Lenny on. I would like to get that going. Yes, I think it's the same thing from once more. That is, would be more the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you took it for granted that it would somehow come out and we would hear it, but you didn't really design it to be heard correctly. So l just, just try it. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then the imitation. Right, the imitation. Also, that what you do is you take the same thing out. change the thing but uh, you don't have to really do it now and anyway you know that you want to that's what you want to mm -hmm. get yes but when you have to make it clear to someone else then when you have to find the right word and that's quite hard to find so you look for it you explain it and while you explain it you explain it to that person to that student but you also explain it to yourself what did Prokofiev say while he wrote that he, he was a very disturbed person you know? to write in seven eighths, which is unequal, yes? very difficult, very unusual. And to have that impetus each papidam, papidam, papapapapadidam, papapapapapidam, papidam. And you yourself must, by, by insisting on that patidam, become uh, imbued with it and become really fired up by it. Yes? Not just by the achievement, not just by the, by the wonderful, uh, the, the way you play it. It's really remarkable, it's really wonderful so clean and so without any real difficulties for you but you still haven't reached that where you make me care yes that I'm as a piano teacher and I'm as a piano player will see without difficulty I will admire it but I as an audience who feels that disturbance who hears that person crying out until it gets to that violent end. Mm -hmm. Now, I won't be caring as much because what I hear is just that it is clean, yes? And loud and good and right. But it's not exciting that, it's, that I can feel it. Your life depends on it. That's what I want. That permits you to play it in the spirit in which it should. Want to try just the opening? <laughs> Be careful that you push yourself with the hand out of the piano, out, because I see when you come up into the upper ranges, da da da, and you are caught, you you sitting inside the key, yes, instead of. You use your fingers to push yourself out. Like like out of your mind, yada down. With these last three beats, just let me have da 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 da. -da. That's right. And if you fly off the chair, you know, <laughs> so be it. Right. And one other thing: if the choice is between the excitement of the performance or the clean note, take the excitement. If you hit it clean, how great! Yes. 
If there's a 50-50% chance, go for it. If it's less than 50%, then you can't go for it, because then you haven't got a chance of hitting it, yes? But if it's 50-50, then take that chance of missing but having the excitement, yes? That's a terrible advice from a piano teacher, but it's the advice that I'm giving myself when I perform. That's how I lived my life in performance. And you can play it. You can really play it marvelously. And you will play it marvelously. Do you want to try that last page? Sure. Playing all my life is just a part of me. Performance is my main thing, my main goal. Hopefully, I can have some type of performance career. I would not say that most students will find jobs in music, ultimately. I think that they'll branch off into used car salesmen, uh, dental assistants, uh, whatever it might be. And I went back and forth between cello, piano, finally ended up with a Bachelor of Music Education degree here at IU. I was getting jobs just to support myself and <clears throat> during the interim time here I'd, somebody had taught me how to do window cleaning. Finally I figured out I could make more money <laughs> doing window cleaning than I could, uh, for instance, like a teaching position here in Bloomington. As far as applying music, to my life right now. Of course, I use it when I play music, but um, believe it or not, playing the cello helped me learn how to do a squeegee. <laughs> I mean, it's a when you really get down to the fine points of washing a window, you know, getting the edges just right, not leaving streaks and relaxation, all that stuff. It's muscular control, just like a bow on a cello. And but from my personal standpoint. I'm glad I didn't do anything else, like be a business major or something, because having that time to learn about music, uh, I mean, I love music, and it's definitely a part of my life. I would like to become a very successful opera singer. This is what I've dreamt about for many, many years, and uh, this would make my life complete if I could have success at what I really want to do with all my heart and all my soul and all of my thoughts. One can never be sure that there is room out there for somebody as a performer. It's not something that you can plan to do. You can just keep trying and keep trying and keep trying and hoping that you get the opportunity. Out of, say, a hundred clarinet students uh, who are in school today, uh, it would be a pretty high percentage to say that two or three or even four would be able to make the professional playing field. Sometimes I, I, I sit here at, at Indiana University and I hear a hundred other people practicing in their practice rooms. And that can be a sobering thought when it comes to finding jobs because many of them are extremely talented. So I went to the business school looking for some security um, and also hoping in the end to combine it with music in some way, perhaps in an administrative way. I went over to the business school and sat through the first semester of classes and found myself thinking about music found myself singing tunes to myself when I was supposed to be learning accounting and wishing I could be practicing. And I, it's not that I adore practicing so much, but I certainly liked it better than what I was doing over there. I decided that security wasn't everything, that there's something about music that you can't quite get out of your system. So I came back. I started in the music school in September of 1964, and I went through until 1970. I saw for myself the future of, of being an opera singer, of going out and having nothing but a, a large singing career, uh, always being away from home, always singing. But um, it, it's a lot of work, and you have to be very self-sufficient. You cannot think of other people. You have to, what well, one teacher said, you must have knives on your elbows. My life changed when I started having children I have three daughters, and I, I was 27 years old when I had my first child, and I'd been running around um, chasing a career. And then when I had that, that little baby and I held her, all of a sudden, that was the most important thing in my life. And I could see singing, 
but I never got the reward from singing that I got from having a child. There is a sense in which when you're singing, you're doing something that's so mystical. I guess there is something sort of, it, it takes you off, you're, you're displaced from, from time somehow. It is a very special thrill that, that it's kind of impossible to describe. Ideally, I think just about the music, and, and sometimes it's especially nice when I kind of get, it's almost like a trance you get, get into when you're playing music, and nothing else really enters your mind except for the music. I recently signed a recording contract with London Decca Records. It's a five-year contract uh, uh, for two records a year for the next five years, which has been very exciting. And I'm making three records this year, and I've already made two. And my very first attempt at a record, I was nominated for a, for a Grammy as Best Vocal Soloist. I mean, the very first time. It was a great shock to me. <laughs> it was extraordinary. That's something I have really don't even know what to expect. I've never really done anything like this before. But it'll be really exciting to, to see myself on a record cover. I, I can't even imagine it. <laughs> but it's, I'm looking forward to it a lot. The most disagreeable part, easily, is having to stuff my life into suitcases and climb on airplanes. It's awful. The parts of my career that I, that I don't like, or that are also, are also in a way the things that I like about the career, is the, the traveling, which I love. I love to see, see uh, lots of you know, interesting places and, and uh, meet lots of people and all that. And that's great. But it, on, the, on the other hand, it takes me away from home a lot. I can't have everything, I guess. The musical preparation that I received in Bloomington at Indiana University was absolutely stupendous. I was stretched. In fact, I probably was stretched even beyond realistic levels in the professional world. Well, my teacher, Mr. Gingold, is, is, has been the, really the biggest influence um, on, on me. He exudes just love for music and for life itself. And of course, musically, he's really the greatest teacher. Anyway, he's become kind of almost a grandfather to me, and uh, I love him very much. The opera experience that I got in Bloomington was wonderful. The preparation was fantastic. The whole theatrical experience is, it's the best. But if someone would have told me 10 years ago that singing, singing is really only about 5% of the career, I would have done something terribly sensible, like go to medical school or something, you know? The problem is that it's so much travel and so much sort of busy things that, that the, the actual walking out on stage and singing music that you love with orchestras and conductors that you love ends up being a very tiny part of it. there's a job or a career out there, everyone here has to perform. A recital is the culmination of all the work, the opportunity to put yourself in the line and to live the dream for an evening. It's nerve-wracking for some, thrilling for others, but for everyone involved, it's a special experience. And a performance actually begins months in advance in a long line of students waiting to reserve a recital time. I counted up only about 290 recital slots available. Uh, Indiana 
a school that yeah. music prides itself on, you know, 900 recitals a year. Well, we're only up to about 370 this year. Well, that means to get up there, which we normally do get up, we're going to have to have between four and 500 recitals. So there's not a lot of time. I'm looking As for mid-April. How about you? Late April. Late April. Okay. Trying to coordinate several groups of family that all want to come. Right. But see, a lot of people will come here saying, okay, I want a time in April. Well, after, say, tomorrow, there won't be a time left in April. My mother gave me a list of dates that I can't <laughs> conflict with. You'll see here she's having circle at her house. Um, she's got to go to Phoenix for a board meeting in March. See, it's very difficult to work this all in. I'm optimistic, I, <laughs> but I hope I get it. March 30th, 31st, April 1st, and 2nd. But April 1st and 2nd are kind of filled already. The 31st is just about filled. Did you say you had the 10 o'clock on the 31st or the 1st? No, the 1st. I'll tell you. It's after a student composition recital, which could mean later. 10, 15. What about the Wednesday? It's after just the doctor voice, so you'd probably be in on time. All right, then I'll take that. Before playing a recital, we have to go through the recital hearing, and that's where we test some of our pieces in front of uh, faculty members, piano faculty members. If they like it, we get to play. If they don't, we don't. There is a lot of pressure at the hearing. You can't just let your adrenaline take over as you can in the performance. And everyone listening knows exactly what you're playing, so you really have to know what you're doing. Dress rehearsal is very important. Uh, <clears throat> that's where I can basically test the balance, hear what the piano sounds like, try the piano in the hall out. Mr. Pressler basically uh, gave me an overall opinion of my performance at the dress rehearsal. He would tell me what the, my overall sound was like, if I'm too loud or if I'm not getting a soft enough sound, sound out of the piano. Just try to get the intense intensity behind my playing. Start the thing, so it's it is infectious. The rhythm will, we will want to dance it too. Yum, da da dum, bum, 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 bum. Yes. Then you start, you walk out, and you keep in your mind what is the tempo of the polonaise. Dum, ba da dum, bi da dee, da da dum. You'll find room to get faster and to get your octaves in. Yes. Don't worry about them. Worry just about the nature of the the head up. Yes. It's like a stately polonaise. Dignity, pride, rhythm. And that when I get, of course, my greatest thrill in seeing a person like a parent has made him free of you while giving him all the principles while he was young on which to build. And play the last one of his conviction. Uh, be glad it is over. Right, so that, when, that was good, that was good. Did you see how much saner tempo you took right now? I advise you, take the same tempo, yes? It's enough insane in this piece, so let's be with the tempo as sane as possible. But bravo, it's something we're gonna look forward to, the recital, yes? And Andrew is just, you know, doing great with him. I think there's a good uh, feeling between them. It seemed to me, just looking at the, uh, rehearsal today that it was so exciting. I'm very excited about him. He's, he's I, I think he's fabulous. I can't wait until Wednesday's concert. All right, I'll get the beer. Okay. Deal. Although I think you should. No, no I'll get it. Um, but I don't have any money. Should I write a check? <laughs> but what, what, else, what else is new, right? Yeah.
Never have any money. He's always loaning you well, money. I don't have money either. Mom. Mom? <laughs> so what kind of beer do you want? Cheap. How much? Generic beer, maybe? My mother's always been behind me since I started the piano. She always reminded me to practice when I was younger. Uh, I had a tendency to forget to practice a few days. <laughs> She's been great. She's been very supportive. And now I'm happy that it, it pays off to have that support behind me. Glad my mother can make it. Uh, these recitals don't happen that often. Okay, I don't know. Maybe you can get one. I'll, I'll just get my uh, purse. Oh, music. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, there's always something last minute. Like I didn't have a handkerchief and forgot my music. And little things like that that okay. always happen last minute. My mother basically took care of all the uh, things for my reception afterwards, which was great. Uh, just drove over to the music school, warmed up for about a half hour, and I was ready. Well, there's an enormous importance to a recital. A recital is somehow an end station, but an end station in which whatever the effort to learn those works, that effort has to come to a climax. But when it really comes into focus is when I feel that that particular student, through whatever I taught him, becomes himself, he gets his own face, yes? Right before the recital, I wasn't too nervous. I think a healthy amount. I get butterflies in the stomach. But I don't get the shakes or anything like that. I don't pace too much either. I try to remain calm for a while. A lot of my friends were out there, and uh, a lot of the piano faculty was there. My adrenaline definitely was flowing at this recital, but I think that happens with just about everyone. As long as I feel in control on the stage, it's okay. I love to perform. The final result of all the work that we put in. A good performance is just a great feeling. When I hear them perform, I am, it's very important to me. I am participating in the performance. I perform with them. I suffer. I have cautions, like as if I would be performing myself. I know when certain points come that present problems for them, I feel the problem very keenly. And, and if I can, I psych myself up so that the message, the good thought goes to them and, and they overcome it like they have overcome it before, of course. Chasing a career in music is a labor of love, a constant struggle for perfection, and a dream only an elite few of these talented musicians will realize. All of them walk on stage ready to perform after years of practice, self-discipline, and hope. The recital is a summing up, a rite of passage leading to the end of school, and perhaps to a career in music for the lucky ones. For these talented young musicians, the joy of sharing music with a receptive audience of friends, relatives, and teachers makes all the work, the years of dedication and discipline, the weekly lessons, the nervousness, all worthwhile. They know there is no guarantee of a career in music, 
But in spite of the uncertainty, the recital is a special moment, and the music making itself is sufficient for the mood. This program was funded in part by a grant from the Indiana Arts Commission with support from the National Endowment for the Arts.